Mr. Hughes. Hello, Graham. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, sir. How are you? Um, um, I'm exceptional. G Graham, let me, just, let me just introduce things. Yes. Um, so um, uh, just let me uh, uh, introduce the show. I'm Tim Hughes. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Digital Leadership Associates. I'm the um, uh, the co-author of the book Social Selling Techniques to Influence Buyers and Changemakers. With me today is um, uh, another author, uh, Graham Hawkins, or is it Graham Hawkins? Everybody seems to uh, talk about you. They always talk about Graham. So, so uh, Graham um, Graham um, is is the author of the book Self Transformation, which certainly, if you're into um, uh, SaaS um, software as a service sales. Um, and seeing the transformation that's going on currently within uh, within the SaaS or the, from the on-premise to SaaS sales environment is certainly a book that, that uh, I think you should get. I've read it and um, I've given it five stars on, on Amazon. So as soon as I read it, I wanted to get uh, uh, Graham on the show to basically talk about things. Graham, just introduce yourself so people that are watching know where they can actually get hold of you before we go into the, the discussion of, the, of your book and your, your, your findings. Yeah, certainly, Tim. Thanks very much. And um, that book released in 2015 was my first attempt at writing a book. So, um, yeah, a lot of fun doing that. But you can find me, as anyone can now, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. And I'm based, as you can tell by the accent, out in Australia. Yeah. I've been uh, a 28-year veteran of the um, sales profession, mostly in sales leadership roles, worked in mostly high tech um, throughout um, Asia Pacific mostly, but I spent three years living and working in London as well. So I've had a fairly reasonable experience across uh, Europe. And uh, my experience, Tim, is mostly working with US software vendors. So in that enterprise space that I know you've worked in as well. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the impetus for me in writing the book, and we'll probably come to this shortly, is, uh, is that I started to notice about 10 years ago a massive change in the way buyers were behaving. And, and hence the title of the book, Sales Transformation. I think when when um, buyers change how they buy, of course, sellers have to change how they sell as well. Yes. Well, you could say the same. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, one of the things that you came across um, was, uh, and you talk about in the book, um, is something that I, I don't think anybody else is really discussing. I mean, I think there's a discussion about SaaS and we can talk about that. But I think one of the things that you were talking about is, is and I'm certainly seeing this because we were actually using it as a technique um, to get to, to get uh, meetings for salespeople, especially in that we had a, I've got, had a cold calling team. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, when you when you spoke to the cold calling team, and you said, what's the number one thing actually that people, that IT departments are doing? And, and usually would you expect security or something to be on the list? Actually, it was about um, reducing the number of vendors that they had or reducing the number of IT systems that they had. And that was actually the number one issue for, for IT departments. Okay, yes, you know, cybersecurity and those were things, but actually what they, they, they had so many different systems from so many different vendors and they needed to get it down. And I remember one of the guys said, you know, he found a way of, of getting into people was to say, I can reduce the number of IT suppliers. And that was the thing that actually got the meetings. Look, 100%, Tim, and I'd love to convey um, a little story that kind of um, led me down this path. And it yes. relates to exactly what you said. Um, in 2010, um, I was the director of sales for a company called Attachmate and enterprise software. Our fourth largest company or customer, I should say, here in Australia was Qantas Airlines. And they represented about a million dollars a year to us in annual um, maintenance and support revenue. And each year we would get together with Qantas and have a fairly argy-bargy type discussion about the negotiation around that, that support renewal. And this particular year in 2010, it was one of those kind of light bulb moments that really told me that things were changing. We were sitting opposite their procurement and vendor management people, myself and my account manager. And they started with the typical vendor bashing that mm. you and I have gotten used to, mm. um, complaining pretty much about everything that we hadn't done and, and really sort of sort of giving us a beating, if you like. Mm. And they must have caught me on a bad day, Tim, because I said, look, do we really have to go through this charade again? 
Um, and, you know, my sales guy turned to me and said, you know, or looked at me like as if I'd gone mad. The Qantas people across the room sort of stopped and looked. And I said, you know, you keep telling us that you want partners and not suppliers. Mm. And yet when we try to get close to you, you, you keep us at arm's length. Mm. And, you know, this, this charade that we're going through of effectively vendor bashing is not really productive for anyone. So I said, you know, can we just move on and, and, and have the negotiation instead of all the vendor bashing? Mm. Yeah. And anyway, um, what that led to was that the, the head of vendor management and procurement at that point said, let's call this meeting to a close. And she said, Graham, you and I need to go downstairs and have a coffee. Okay. So off we, went, off we went down to the coffee shop. The sales guy just sat in the foyer very quickly and I sat down with Prue Jacobson, who was the, the head of vendor management. She said to me, and I'll never forget this because it just it sent so many um, sort of warning bells off in my mind in terms of where the, the whole business was going. She said, I need to let you know about some important changes to Qantas. I said, go on. She said, as you know, we, like every other business, we divide our vendors up into a vendor stack. We rank order them in terms of priority. And she said, in tier one, we've got three tiers. In tier one, we have five vendors, and those are the, the big key sort of strategic suppliers or integrators, so Fujitsu and IBM and HP and those guys. In tier two, we have 13, typically the Adobe's, the Microsoft's, Oracles, those sorts of people. And then she said, and in tier three, and I knew, I knew where she was going. She said, in tier three, we have 363 independent technology suppliers. And I knew she was going to say, and you're in that category. But what she said next shocked me. She said, I've been given a directive by the CIO to take that 363 number right. back to 100. And of course, I said, what does that mean for us? She said, well, it means one of two things. It means you'll either be culled and we will find a substitute product from a, another supplier, probably a prime or a tier one or two supplier. And I knew that was possible, by the way, because IBM had a product right. that could displace us. The other alternative that she mentioned was that if you're not culled, then you will be told within 24 months that you will be forced to sell your products into Qantas right. via one of the tier ones. And and they would and they would probably take a cut so or another, a, a place of markup on it and that. But you you would lose your direct uh, access to the customer. hundred oh. percent. Yeah. Now as you know, um, either one of those scenarios represents a massive change to my go to market plan. If if all of a sudden our fourth largest customer down here in this little market in Australia is saying to us, no, you can't have an arms, you can't have a relationship with us. You're at arm's length, or indeed you have to go via effectively a reseller model. That, that that was a huge change, and it placed our business at a fair bit of risk. So then I uh, went home with my tail between my legs, and um, I thought, well, I wonder how many others are thinking along these lines. And to cut a long story short, I then went out and asked each and every one of our key sort of senior buyers um, what they were doing with regards to vendor rationalisation. So, and the, the feedback was uh, unanimous. Every single one of them was looking to reduce vendors, as you said, more business with less vendors. Now, to give you an idea of the scale, Qantas, as it turns out, was fairly small. So National Australia Bank, we were also categorised as a tier three vendor. And they have 1,100 right. vendors that supply the bank. And it's, I think, National Australia Bank's the third largest bank here in Australia. We have four big banks. And with 1,100 independent technology suppliers to the bank, they are also looking to rationalise back to 600. So, you know, in a, in a small marketplace like Australia where once upon a time as a sales guy, I viewed all of my markets as kind of greenfield, wide open, you know, infinite numbers of people that we could sell to. All of a sudden, your existing customers are saying to you, you know, we're going to shut the door on you shortly. And I said to um, a couple of my sales guys, you know, if, if you turn up at a business as a new salesperson now and you're told, here are your, here are your accounts, off you go and start selling. 
which I'm sure is what happened to you most of your career as well. Um, if you're facing that particular vendor rationalization situation, then your chances of being success successful are yes. limited dramatically. Yes. So all of a sudden you start thinking about, well, what's my, what's the balance between acquisition and retention? Should we be focused more on, uh, you know, making sure we're protecting ourselves with those existing customers first and foremost? Yeah. So it did raise a lot of questions. It led to um, me taking a real, uh, a real sort of um, fascinated interest in what what this all meant. Hence the research. Hence the book. And as you said, hence the, the sort of key theme of the book being centred around this idea of vendor rationalisation. And is this something that has come from the um, uh, the, the self market and the move towards that? Or do you think this is something that's just that's happening across the whole of the market? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think the simple answer mm. is it's happening across the board. I think, um, you know, certainly at the yeah. enterprise end of town where, you know, meeting with Suncorp, another sort of second tier bank out here, the CIO at Suncorp said to me, um, we have in, the, in, in fact put in place a policy for blocking yes. off-panel purchases. So in other words, so in other words yeah. if you're not already on the panel and you're a new vendor you're turning up trying to knock the door down and get in to sell to Suncorp, mm. you have no chance. So, you know, certainly at the enterprise end of town and the second and third tier sort of getting down to SMEs when they're, they, over the years, they've built up such huge amounts of um, supplier agreements and arrangements, they have to re reduce that in order to, uh, you know, drive out some cost. Um, in that same meeting, Tim, if I can just explain, the CIO at Suncorp, uh, while we were sitting in his office, he pointed behind him and he said, see all these people behind me. And there were 17 full-time employees sitting behind him in this little um, open plan area. He said, each one of those people is our vendor contracts management team, or that is our vendor contracts management team. And he said, um, that is a massive cost for us in just dealing with you can imagine each one of the suppliers that supplies their business has a separate set of terms and conditions and, you know, a completely um, unique set of uh, guidelines as to how they engage. Mm. And that's a huge cost to that business, just mm. managing those contracts. I'm sure you would have seen yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah, I, I did. And, and, I, and I think quite often um, the, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I was dealing. I had a team of people who did telesales, and I and I think um, you know there was there was an you know if you rang up Doncaster, I'm just picking a name of an organisation um, out out at random, Doncaster Borough Council, and and a salesperson got a lead, and and it was like I've got a meeting with um, the uh, senior person in finance at Doncaster, and and everyone was going, oh great, Doncaster are going to look to buy a new ERP system. And it's like, well, actually not. They're actually, um, the reason why we got the meeting was the fact that um, uh, they've got some things somewhere around the business, and and if they put, and and we've got that functionality in our ERP system, and they could actually get rid of a couple of vendors. And I don't think actually that was ever talked about. It was always, you know, the fact that hey, we got a lead and we got a meeting, and 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 isn't that great? But there wasn't necessarily people sitting there going, yeah, we need a new ERP system. And actually, if certainly if if the meeting was driven through IT. I mean, IT generally don't want more IT systems because they've got enough already, unless some, there's some strategic review going on. But usually, if the, if if I mean, you know, we we'd get we'd get meetings through the business. But if the meeting was driven through IT, it was through through, through this vendor um, uh, rationalisation thought process, really. And that's and and if there's people out there watching this, you know, it's a technique that you can use to actually get meetings. You know, use it to your advantage. I'm not saying that it's a you know. Uh, um, also, you, you talk about in your book, you know, that the, this this the move towards SaaS. And I was part of a sales transformation where we, you know, we went from selling you know one two million dollar system a year that generally kind of came through the letterbox through some sort of um, RFP to doing five two hundred and fifty k deals where you had to go out and and, and actually find them. And that was a massive transformation in the way that we, the way that we went to market, the way that we articulated, and the disruption that actually caused because we had people like Financial Force coming in, who in effect were trying to close at the first meeting. 
you know, we, we were used to 18 month sales cycles where you could sort of like potter wrong and if you made a mistake, you could kind of pull it back. And there, there, we're, there we are in a position where we know that the people that have probably been in first have actually tried to close their heads. Um, and that kind of needed a different, whole different type of salesperson. And we're not, I'm not really even talking about, you know, I, I'm known for social, about social selling and I'm, and I'm not talking here about social selling. I'm talking about a different way of actually approaching the sale, the sales process. Um, and 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 dealing with the customer because actually we have to react to to, to the way that our competition are are, are, are are have changed and we're having to deal with the fact that um, uh, well the customer is buying differently or has different motives in the way that they want to buy. Yep. Yeah, indeed. And and look, um, some of the customers down here in Australia, sort of around that same time frame, you know, six or so years ago started to say to us that we are sick and tired of vendors and their mm. perpetual license models. We're sick, we're sick and tired of large upfront payments whereby the vendor throws us a piece of software and then says, off you go, Bye. you know, good luck. Um, yeah, we move on to the next one. And um, I started hearing vendors, uh, sorry, customers say, we want risk share models. We want you as our vendor to take a long-term view of the partnership and to share in some of the risk rather than just you know, those old models where we pay you everything up front and you walk away um, and book the revenue and we're left to try and get the value out of the product. So in the research phase of the book, I also read, um, you know, another one of those kind of light bulb moments for me was reading right. Consumption Economics, that book that talks about mm. the new rules of tech. And when you look at the, you know, the emergence of cloud and managed service provision and the, the way that's all headed, it just makes sense for buyers to be looking to not just try before you buy and pilot and do those proofs of concepts that they like to do, but to share with the vendor, their partner of choice, in the risk and in the journey so that everyone's invested equally in making sure the customer gets maximum value. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Those, those consumption-based models, um, you know, the arms around experience that customers now demand through through an investment by the vendor in a longer term. Yeah, and I, I think that the, the, the SaaS model kind of has, 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 has driven that. You know, the, um, um, uh, and, and in a way, you know, there was a forcement to say, yes, we want people to take partnership of skin in the game. Um, and now what we're finding because of because of SaaS, people are going to be paying monthly or quarterly or something like that anyway. Um, and that's kind of like jumped ahead of it. Um, and um and, and i wrote an article recently about how the close plan was kind of was 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 really no you know wasn't required anymore because it was all it was all about this all about the salesperson about how we get the, the, the uh, how we get the, the sign on you know signing on the dotted line and while that's important because you have to have a commercial agreement um really you know you need to be positioning your salespeople. we need to be positioning the fact how we're going to create the value for the customer and, and in a way, you need to have, you know, it's a value plan or a go live plan or, or, or whatever you want to call it um, and actually show the people that you're, um, uh, you know, this is where we're going to get the ROI for you. This is where we're going to create the value. And then let's work back. And these are the things that we need to do. And oh, part of oh, part of the thing, one of the things we need to do, by the way, is actually sign the contract. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and look at it from from that perspective. And I think. The IT industry has matured a bit to actually move away. I'm, I'm not so aware of, of um, vendors that now do drop a bit of software and walk away. I think there's a there's a there's a realization that that people can because of SaaS can actually just switch this stuff off. I totally, I totally agree. In the last three years, in particular, a lot of that has changed. And yeah, your post was spot on. I think the old days of you know, sales leader pushing the sales team for a closed plan and, you know, how do we bring this deal forward? How do we get this customer to buy this quarter rather than next? Mm. I think those days are over. I think we're all, whether we like it or not, we're all being forced to take a much more strategic and long-term view of our relationships with buyers and to make sure that, you know, uh, well above and beyond the first sale that the customer continues to get value. And look, Tim, when you combine that kind of new ethos, if you like, or that new mentality with the fact that, that as we talked about earlier, that 
buyers are wanting to do more business with less vendors, it just makes sense that you've taken a longer term view and you're trying to build um, the existing customers that you've got um, and maximise the headroom in those accounts because the old days of quickly going out and finding net new all the time, it's getting harder and harder. So we have to take much more you know, risk share, um, much more long-term extended buying journey type view with the, yeah, the buyer. Yeah, I, I, Just I think sense. it's – my view is that, that, that um, I mean, there are products out there that are, that are, that are, that are new. Um, but in many cases, what you're seeing is 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 a is a um, a slicing, a salami slicing of the value proposition. So you know, we we had all lots of little systems, and we then had big systems, and now we kind of seem to be going back to having lots of little systems. Um, but you know, there's an app for this and an app for that, and that's kind of slicing down some of the the the, the uh, some of the big applications. Um, but that does mean if you're selling those things, people have probably got it already. So, so we're probably in some, well, I think that we're in some form of replacement market. Certainly if you think about ERP, most people have got one. So, you know, why would you, why would you, why would you change and buy another one? Because this other one took us, you know, took us a billion dollars to implement and, and we don't, we, we don't really want to do it again. So, so, and, and I think that's one of the things that certainly I've seen from a sales transformation perspective where you have to build relationships with people. Because the only way that you're going to do that is not, you know, I'm a I'm a new business sales guy. That's what I I I I I, I do, and that's about turning up at an organisation un, unknown, probably cold, building relationship with an organisation and getting them to trust you to actually sign something, um, and and it, that's really really hard. So you have to be able to build relationships now before you actually turn up with your with your bags and 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 say, you know, but buy one of these i'm being facetious in the way i say that but um and and i, and I think that that's that's why for me it's crucial that you're actually building those things on social and having that personal brand that when you actually turn up as a new business salespeople, they know who you are so so it's probably worth you know yeah. what, what's your view on on it wouldn't be a, a a tim talk without talking about social selling i mean what's your view on 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 social and social selling and and well um i'm a, i guess a relative to you tim i'm a i guess a latecomer to to social um i really only started i mean i joined up linkedin like everybody did back yeah. in 2004 or somewhere around there so i've been up linkedin for a long time but um, I've really only understood the power of social probably in the last three or four years. And as you write in your book so eloquently, um, the real power for me of social is in that listening element, you know, really being able to understand and glean from those social platforms what it is that your target customers are doing and saying and, um, you know, what it is that they're looking for, those little snippets of information that can give you, you know, a huge leg up in terms of, competitive differentiation. So to me, it's mostly about listening. I've been working hard in my own business in the last 12 months in particular to build my LinkedIn following through, you know, a content marketing approach. Knowing that, you know, everyone's been talking for a while now about creating inbound. And it wasn't until probably the last six months that I've really understood the power of social to be able to create inbound for you, not just extend your reach and, you know, global reach, but once you start to position yourself as a thought leader in any kind of sales capacity, regardless of industry, the power to turbocharge your sales plan with just, it boggles my mind now. I'm, I'm really starting mm -hmm. to see the benefits. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, um, with your approach um, that you outline in your book and, to me, I think what you said is exactly right. It's mostly about listening. I, uh, I'm seeing like you are, and I think you mentioned it once in your book, um, a number of people that come back to me after having just connected that want to immediately pitch something to me. And I think you say um, you, you don't do on social what mm. you wouldn't do in the real world, in the physical world. And yes. yet a lot of people do for some reason. Yes, I, I, I was... Um, so... You, you you actually recommended me to, to, to somebody um, and um, uh, uh, Noah in terms of, and, and, and we, we did a, a, a webinar and I told him the story about, you know, you, when, when you go on a first date, you don't pitch up and, um, um, and immediately propose marriage. 
um, you know, you, you build up a relationship and you kind of work out whether you've got shared values and and then maybe, you know, six months, 12 months, 10 years or whatever it is, you may propose marriage. And, and he actually came up with a, a nice quip as well. He said that, yeah, and also what you don't do is you have on this, the, the Internet um, a list of all your um, uh, previous conquests which is what a lot of salespeople do in terms of their LinkedIn profile about how many deals they've done and how many times that they've made quota, you know, and, and, you know, um, I, I'm a great believer in the sales profession. I think it's a, you know, I, I think we're up there and we should be classed along with doctors and solicitors and, and things like that. But there are a lot of people who actually see it as a way of, of being manipulative. Um, and, and, and it's always the, the, um, those, those negative stories that come out and, and people avoid salespeople. And that's why people are using social to go on and, and do yeah. research and they're doing it in a way of avoiding salespeople. Um, and I think if you've seen as a helper and an educator and, a, and, and have a relationship and, and if you've got a strong personal brand and you're a, uh, a thought leader, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're everywhere on, on social and I'm always bumping into finding you or people are connecting to me and the person that, we, that they have in common with me is you. And it's, it's, and, and it's all that sort of stuff. And you go, oh, there's Graham again. Oh, there's Graham again. There's Graham again. And um, oh, this person is really interesting. Oh, there's Graham again. And, and it's that sort of thing that that, that 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 gets you that gets you the authenticity and the trust. I think with with, with people. Yeah, well, you're right. And um, as you said before, by the time you turn up to meet somebody in a sales context, they already know what you are all about. They know your unique promise of value. You've short, you've effectively shortened the touch points, haven't you, or the sales cycle, because you've almost bypassed a whole chunk of it where you're having to develop trust and rapport. Because if your personal brand is is done the way it should be, all of those factors are taken care of. I read I read something interesting the other day, um, Tim from Derek Wazinski, who said that um, something like forty eight percent of new business purchases now begin not just on social but actually on Amazon. Yes. People are reading um, referrals on Amazon to get, you know, independent third party views. Yeah, well, it was, was I, I read something about that just before I'd actually written my book, which is why I've, whenever anybody comes to me about the book, I mean I I in the book I talk about sending me a selfie because what I want to do with my audience is actually build a relationship. And it's not actually some sort of um it's not that you know it, it's and and, and, I, and i actually want people to go i've got the book hi tim um you know it's really great you know i'm, I'm gonna you know and, and, and i'm actually interested in people to come back and, and give me feedback but if they do what i always do is i say can you give me a review uh on amazon because it is so important to get reviews on um uh in terms of future sales uh, last time i looked on amazon.co.uk which is the main platform for me i had something like 21 Five star reviews, um, and 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 there is a there is a um, there's there's something there's a, a statistic somewhere that the, the more more reviews actually drive sales. Um, but I think more and more people are using uh, non Google based searches because actually we're used to going and you know if we, if we want to um, you know the days of going in and saying what's the capital of Nigeria. And asking those sort of questions are kind of over. What you're kind of looking for is, can you find me a great French restaurant in, um, uh, you know, in in the capital of Nigeria? You know, we're asking more detailed, and and and, and Google are having to provide more relevance. But also, what we're doing, therefore, is that we're being more selective about where we go and actually do the searches, like Amazon. I do a lot of search on Twitter. Um, you know, if, if there's a if there's a crash, if I'm stuck on in traffic on the M25 around London, and I go to Google and search, uh, you know, crash on the M25, I get a a, a piece of information from 2012. Um, whereas if I go to Twitter, there's probably yeah. someone at the front of that person um, actually taking pictures that is saying I'm stuck in the traffic, and and here's the pictures of what's going on. So you can actually get something more up to date. And I think we do that. We find we now we're all educated enough to know that we go to different platforms. I've got an Alexa. I've got an Amazon Echo. Yeah. So I'm using that. I, I'm now using voice to to search. And I think you know within ten years time we all go. Do you remember when we used to type into? Do you remember keyboards? Yeah, hundred um, percent. I got speaking of Noah. You mentioned Noah at the outset. I got fooled the other day when he said I'll have my um, 
my PA contact you and sort out a time for our appointment. And I got an email, I got an email from Amy and I said, yep, yeah, can't do this time, but I can do that time. And back and forth, we went three or four times. And I'm thinking I'm emailing with a, a real person. Of course, it was, a, it was an artificial it. intelligence bot. Because actually the process of yeah. saying I can't do this and that it is easily um, uh, uh, kind of automated because you actually use a particular language that that, 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 that program can actually pick up. Um, good. Is, so is there any sort of um, any any sort any any message that you want to get over to the people or any bits of advice you want to provide to people? Because we've, we've come up to the 30 minutes. So. Yeah. Look, not really, Tim, um, other than to say, since we just touched on it there with, you know, you mentioning about the routine elements of the sales role and, and um, you know, which parts of the sales role can be automated in the future. I'm, I'm just about oh, wow. to finish my second book called, yeah, called aptly The um, right. Future of the Sales Profession. I've, tr I've tried to take a, a fairly dispassionate look about where this is all headed um, and I've, I've done quite a bit of research into, you know, the various trends, the mega trends that are now impacting and driving where sales is going, primarily from the viewpoint of the buyer, because at the end of the day, the buyer is the one that dictates. So that book will be available. Are you self-publishing um, again? At the beginning. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of um, March, I'll have that ready for release. And it's going to be a, uh, a, a warts and all look into where I think sales is going, given all of this technology advancing that we're, we're seeing that, mm. that you've written okay, about fantastic. in your book. Well, well, Graham, thank you for, for coming on board. Yeah. So, so again, this is this is Graham's current current book, though there's a new one coming out in March, so it depends when you're you're, you're watching this. Um, Graham, what's your, your, your Twitter account? Uh, Transform Trans Sales. And, so and, your, my, and, your, and your Graham... Yeah, my, Hawkins, H A W K I N S on on um, on LinkedIn. Brilliant. Thank you for your Great. time today, Graham. It's been really yep. insightful. Thank you very much. Uh, is it is it the evening or morning for you? Oh, it's evening over here, and we're uh, we're in the middle of a bit of a hot spell in Melbourne. We had thirty eight degrees Celsius yesterday. Okay, so we had a frost, and here. it's um, eight thirty in the morning here, so uh, a winter, of course. I remember our, our coffee, Tim, over there in London in yes. um, December. It was it was quite a culture shock for me to get back to that sort of cold. Okay, Graham, thanks very much for your time today, and uh, and good luck. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure, Tim. Thank you.